grandma has this dress. No. Neither. I feel like Harry Potter. Too librarian. Too Bono? No. 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 Big no. Yes. I look a little bit like a bumblebee. How long you been in these parts? Bleh. If sadness had a color. I bought this? Your Honor, I object. Hmm? No. This is so much like my dad. That is the ticket.
Support for KQED Live comes from Berkeley Rep and the San Francisco Symphony. impact of more than COVID half of black business owners and disproportionate somehow we always find a way Welcome to rise to the blueprint builders to the backbones of every block for the curators of the culture and for generations to follow you might fall but never fail keep rising keep rising keep rising apply for a business marketing and tech makeovers on us Well, good evening. My name is Dana Chung, and I am a member of KQED's Community Advisory Panel. We are a group of community members that supports KQED in community building. To learn more about our work, you can visit kqed.org slash cap. I want to begin by acknowledging that KQED headquarters are located on Ramaytush Ohlone land. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on this occupied land and that we owe a collective debt to its original stewards. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, KQED is California's PBS NPR member station. KQED Live is our new multi-platform events program that produces screenings, talks, performances, and food tastings based on KQED's mission to inform, inspire, and involve. You can learn more at kqed.org slash live. If we bring value to your everyday life, I encourage you to consider becoming a KQED member. You can find out about how at kqed.org slash donate. We want to thank the season sponsors that make KQED Live possible, including San Francisco Symphony, SF MoMA, Comcast Business, and Berkeley Rep. We are so grateful for their commitment to supporting the mission of civic and cultural engagement in the Bay Area. And now, as you can see from the picture that's going to be coming up, I too have a mixed family. Uh, My spouse is a Uh, immigrant from Singapore, and together we have three children who are Chinese Singaporean and have grown up here in the Bay Area. In fact, one of them is with me here this evening. He can attest that KQED is always playing on the radio, in the car, and in our home. And so if you are enjoying these incredible series on KQED, and if you want to listen after the show, then please visit kqed.org slash mixed race. And now let's introduce our host for this evening. Marissa Lagos is a correspondent for KQED's California Politics and Government's Desk and co-hosts a weekly show and podcast, Political Breakdown. At KQED, Lagos conducts reporting, analysis, and investigations into state, local, and national politics for Rady, radio, TV, and online. And Sasha Coca is host of the California Reports weekly magazine program, which takes listeners on sound-rich excursions to meet the people that make the Golden State unique through audio documentaries. All right, let's welcome Sasha and Marissa to join us on the stage. What are you? I just never understood why, why can't you include all of me? You know, where do I fit in? Who do I identify with? I need all my mixed people to talk about it, express yourself, your perspective. I'm mixed and I'm proud of it. Being myself and having an awesome family. I have always been a mixed person. I wouldn't know how to think of myself otherwise and I'm not planning on changing. <laughs> You guys, it's so awesome to see you all here tonight. So many mixed people in the house. Woo-hoo! 
I'm Sasha Coca. I'm the host of the California Report magazine. I'm Marisa Lagos. As you know, I normally cover politics. But somehow I wrangled her into doing a series about growing up mixed here in California. And you know, when we started this uh, several years ago, it was actually kind of based on Kamala Harris's ascension to the White House. We thought it was really fascinating that we had a mixed race vice president, somebody so visible. And we started looking into kind of her history and thinking about a series. And then we realized, like, don't tell her, but she wasn't the most interesting part of the story. <laughs> you all were. Um, when we started calling out to listeners and talking to our own friends and family, we just realized that this is not a subject that had a lot of visibility outside of, like, sort of our individual experiences. And one of the things that happened is that so many of you in this room shared your stories with us. You might have seen some of your photos on the slide reel at the beginning of the night. We had folks sending in like five page emails to us about their mixed experiences. People recording themselves and sending their voices in so we could put them on the radio. I mean, it was a really incredible moment where we realized people in California want to talk about this. I mean, we are a state with a growing mixed demographic. We're finally being counted on the census. We got stories to tell. Yeah. So what, three, four years later, <laughs> we're doing it. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're, we're just so excited you're all here. We had such a great crew. If you haven't listened to the series, we hope you do. There's actually a QR code so you can find it easily. But we just want to shout out like Kip Fulbeck, um, a photographer and UCSB professor, really helped us kick it off. We had Guap from Oakland. He's a rapper. Ty Babylonia. Yeah, one of my childhood idols, figure skater Ty Babylonia. We got to talk to her. We have some special guests in the audience tonight who we'll bring up later who were also part of this series. Uh, the writer, Shetty Moraga. I mean, there were so many wonderful And interviews. Reginald Daniel, who we have to... Yeah, we, we have to mention Reggie. That's he, right. He passed away right after we taped with him. He was the last voice you heard before we came out. Um, and he's really just, I think, a pioneer in the sort of multiracial disciplinary within academia. Um, right. He taught the longest running course on mixed race studies in this nation, I think, at UC Santa Barbara. Incredible guy. So there'll be storytelling, there's going to be dancing, there's going to be music, uh, there'll be food at the end. We're really excited. Um, and we're kind of nervous because I usually am up here interviewing other people, not Me talking too. about Me myself. Too. Exactly. So this is really <laughs> vulnerable. Um, so Sasha's going to go first. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, guys. If you're mixed, you might have grown up using metaphors to talk about your family to the outside world. I know my family did. We would say things like cream and coffee. We would say half and half. We would say, weirdly, sometimes white bread and brown bread. <laughs> you might have had different ones in your family. Maybe you guys said Mexidu, or maybe you said Latinese, maybe Blasian. Or maybe, like Tiger Woods, maybe you said Coblinasian. Maybe your kitchen growing up had hot sauce and soy sauce. Maybe you had tapatillo and kikoman, or maybe kimchi and kugel. I know my family kitchen growing up had corned beef and naan. You probably talked about yourself using fractions. I did. I went through life as a kid saying, I'm half. I'm half Indian, Punjabi, and half white, Irish American, 50 50, right? And even when I went to India, I would talk about myself in my broken Hindi because I felt like I had to explain why I looked different than my cousins. And in my broken Hindi, I would say, I'm Adi Larki, half girl. But inside, I didn't feel fragmented. I didn't feel like I was two pieces. I just felt like I was growing up in a house with a brown dad and a white mom, and we celebrated a ton of holidays. <laughs> we celebrated Easter and Holy. We celebrated Mother's and Father's Day and Rocky Brother Sister's Day. We celebrated Christmas and Diwali. And that was pretty cool. What I also knew about myself as a kid is that I like to ask questions. I was a baby reporter at heart. In fact, my dad recently dug up this video of me as a nine-year-old. It's kind of embarrassing, but I'm going to let you guys have a little peek at it. It's of me interviewing my grandfather, my dadaji, about our family tree. 
Okay, we're starting. Welcome to Family Tree. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Amarnath Koka. He's here to tell us about his family from India. Here's your pen and you may start. Let's, let us start with your children. Please write in the names of your children. I will read them off as you write Thank you. I'm just getting a note that my earrings are hitting the mic. Sorry, guys. Uh, hang on one second. Sorry. All right. Better? Thank you. Um, here, let me give you back my note. Thank you. Um, anyway, so you can tell I was kind of a sassy little kid, and I like liked being a reporter. And as I got older, I realized that that ability to ask questions the ability to translate between my dad and my mom, the two parts of my family. Yes, Papa, Christmas is really important to mom. We do have to get a Christmas tree. <laughs> yes, mom, Papa will put chaat masala on everything, even in his orange juice, even if you don't like the way it tastes. <laughs> that that ability to translate between the two parts of my family, between my parents, was a kind of superpower. It was a superpower of being a fly on the wall, being able to understand things from multiple perspectives and consider things from more than just one or two or three sides. And I think it's part of what makes me a good journalist today is that ability to really consider that there are multiple ways of looking at things in the world and that I can translate stories and ideas across communities. Growing up in the 1980s, there weren't a lot of families that looked like mine. Intermarriage in the South Asian community then was pretty uncommon. And my dad, who came to the US in the early 1960s, he was expected to head straight back home to India and have an arranged marriage, which is what my uncles and aunties did. Nobody expected that he would fall in love with a hard-headed Irish Catholic woman whose last name was literally white. <laughs> and my brother and I, we turned out different shades of mixed. He's a little bit darker than I am. He had an Indian name. My parents somehow gave me a Russian name, Sasha, because they liked it. But anyway, we both have blue eyes. And we were often too white for our brown family and too brown for our white family. At my white grandfather's funeral, I remember overhearing a friend of his asking, who the dark cousins were. And then at the Indian family gatherings, we were way too white or American, is what they called us. We didn't get the crass Punjabi jokes. And we certainly weren't going to have semi-arranged marriages like my cousins. As a teenager, I was way too queer for both my Irish-American nana and my traditional Hindu aunties, my buas. I just couldn't seem to find my people. When I got to college, I was so excited. I went straight to the South Asian Students Association to their first meeting, and they asked me straight up what I was doing there. Was it my short hair or, or my light skin, or maybe it was my Russian name? Did I need to carry my family pictures around to prove my authenticity? I thought, I know, maybe I'll wear my salvar and kurta, my traditional Indian clothes, but then I thought, Maybe they'll just think I'm a Hare Krishna or like a Kundalini practitioner or some kind of exotifier. Didn't they see I was wearing my grandmother's nose ring? It's an insecurity I still have, even today, even after being deeply involved in the South Asian community for decades. Every time I walk into a room, I always wonder, are they going to know I'm part of them? Maybe that's part of why I felt like I had to show you guys family pictures tonight to prove to you that I belong in the mixed crowd, too. I mean, I wasn't even sure I wanted to MC this show tonight, even after hosting a whole radio series and podcast about being mixed in California. I thought, well, if I get up there, maybe they're going to think I don't look mixed enough to be MCing a show about being mixed. I know that my skin privilege and my light eyes mean I don't face the same kind of racism other people in my family do, that's for sure. But 
I don't feel comfortable in all white spaces either. Not in all white queer spaces. Certainly not in a yoga class with a white teacher who says, Namaste. <laughs> It wasn't until I found my community of fellow mixed folks, people like you in this room tonight, that I felt like I was finally starting to come home. And that doesn't mean that all of us in this room share the same experience, not at all, even if we all identify as mixed in some way. I mean, I know my experience as a person with one white parent is very different than somebody who has two BIPOC parents or somebody who has black ancestry. It's different than my partner, who's Japanese and Mexican. And by the way, we did have a big, fat, Punjabi, Irish, Mexican, Japanese wedding, <laughs> complete with tandoori chicken, a taco truck, my cousin's Irish fiddle band, a mariachi band, and a sake toast. <laughs> I know my kids are growing up in a world where there are lots of kids like them on the playground. I mean, to them, it's no big deal that our family kitchen has wasabi and ghee and tortillas and ketchup. And most of the time, it's no big deal to my kids that they have four grandparents from four different races. They don't have any problems checking more than one box or just blowing up the boxes all together. But they still have questions. When my kid was little, he said to me, Mom, maybe my hands are my Irish part, or my nose is my Japanese part, or, or maybe my hair is Indian, or, or maybe my ears are my Mexican part, or maybe because I really, really love sushi, maybe I'm more Japanese. <laughs> yes, yes, race is a construct, and I got to explain that to my kids, but it's also part of how society is still organized here in the US, and it's deeply embedded in its history. We know here in California, the Spanish, the conquistadores, they had their charts, the casta paintings, they called them, where they would spell out who's a mulato, who's a mestizo, right? It was all a way to maintain racial hierarchies. Slavery. <laughs> Slavery depended on the one-drop rule to perpetuate that system. Blood quantum for Native Americans. I know all of that might sound really academic or like a history lesson, particularly for you middle schoolers in the crowd, but it's really important as we navigate our mixed identities because we have to push past people's perceptions and biases every day in this world that's organized around race. And we have to know when to push past the gatekeepers who might say, we're not enough of something. We also have to know when to step aside and make space because our experience, or sometimes our privilege, is different than other people in our communities who aren't mixed. But we also have to know when it's a time to take up space, like tonight. Tonight is a time when we can shout out to all of our ancestors, we can celebrate all of our diversity, all of our complexity, all of our beauty. So let's move past the idea, let's help each other move past the idea that we are just DNA tests or decimals or blood quantum charts. We are not fractions. I am not half and half. I'm not using that anymore. I am whole. We are whole. Thank you. <laughs> Marisa, come on back up. You just made me do that. Back, Very back. wonderful. All right, we would love to invite Dr. Jen Noble to come up to the stage now. She participated in our series. Yeah, bring that up with you. Come around. Um, she is a psychologist from LA who actually focuses her practice on mixed race children and their families. And she's the one who told us not to use fractions, which my mom who's We're watching so online tonight got in trouble for. She actually made a pie chart on a paper plate when I was a kid. So um, I'm going to hand you that. And I, I think, can you just first kind of explain, like, why is the fraction thing so important? I mean, to me, I think it has multiple layers, right? So, but the first piece is when you break someone into fractions, you, you're lessening them. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that a lot of mixed race adults then sort of feel like, oh, I'm half this, I'm half that, or quarters and eights and all that. But then it becomes, I'm only, like, mm -hmm. I'm only oh, half. Yeah. And so I find a lot of mixed race folks say like, when I want to enter those spaces, like when I want to go to the South Asian Student Association, they're like, should I go? Because I'm only half. Like you mm -hmm. already kind of made yourself less than. So if you just replace 
the halves with like an and, mm -hmm. then you get to really, it's like a very powerful it is, shift. It's empowering. Yeah, it really to is. then yeah. just say instead of, I, I used to say I'm, I'm half Sri Lankan, half African American. But when I just say I'm Sri Lankan and African American, it's like, oh, oh I got two. Like, I'm both. Oh, yeah. You know, instead of like, I mean, I'm just, yeah. you know. Yes, and. Yeah. So I think that's a big piece of it. And then you kind of got at the other piece of like, this, our country, our society really has a habit of fractionizing or um, doing that in order to oppress and make mm -hmm. you sort of less. There's, there's, ulterior motives it becomes weaponized you know it can be weaponized within a family like oh well you're just half so you know you don't you can't speak or you can't play with us so that kind of thing i think is really important yeah so dr jen has a ton of great advice for families um top two like what advice do you give to parents of multiracial kids who may not you know share that i mean now we're I mean, now we're in multi generations of mixed yeah. families yeah. too. But yeah. I mean, what? How, but but you're never the same as your kids mix, exactly. right? Exactly. So right. what? What are the kind of top lines? And you know, the first one I always say is start talking about race and ethnicity now. You know, um, a lot of parents are like, oh, I don't know. My kid is only three or four. Is it too soon? Is it too much? Like, no, it's not. There are books that uh, address race and ethnicity that are geared towards three and four year olds, you can do it at an age appropriate level. I think one of the biggest reasons for why, um, you know, mixed race adults have that like stereotypical, confused, where do I belong type of thing is because a lot of times their parents never sat down and mm -hmm. said, hey, mm -hmm. you know you're more than one thing, right? And you know you can claim all of this and you know this is how you can incorporate it into yourself. So when you don't talk about race and ethnicity, it leaves the kid fending for themselves and then of course going to their peers who you know it's it's great if you're 11 and you go to the wisdom of another 11 year old who's like <laughs> don't do it yeah no you Don't can't you can't be that and oh no you're not this enough you're not then the kids like oh my friend told me the truth like no your parents should be like don't listen to what they're going to tell you mm -hmm. um so that's why i say that's start now there's all manner of ways to do that at an age appropriate level and i guess the number two would be if you are a parent that's not mixed race yourself, really learning as much as you can about the mixed race experience. Um, you will just never live the life that your kid is gonna live. Um, and no matter what the mix is, no matter what state, there are just some universal experiences that we all share. So if a parent can start to learn that and be like, oh, my kid's probably gonna get this, they're gonna face that, they're gonna go through these microaggressions. Like, let me be ready to talk about it and prepare my kid for it. Um, that's, you know, I think a lot of parents don't do that. They just think, oh, well, you know, my kid, my kid's just like me, you know, I'm, I'm black, you're black too. And the kid's like, but also you married someone else. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, which is especially hard if you only have one parent. Exactly, even yeah. more so. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we've got more on uh, parents coming up in the show, um, but stay with us, okay. Dr. Jen, because now we're going to invite all of you to jump in for a second. When you came in, you found a couple papers on your chair, and I want you to just listen to the instructions for a minute and then go ahead and do them. There is a piece of paper with a green border on it, and it has a question for you, which says, what's in your mix? That's the green one, right? You don't have to be mixed race to be part of this. You don't. What, whatever that means to you, it may be that you actually want to you know, put down your ethnicities. It may be that you're like, actually, I do this and this and that in my life, or I'm a great cook, or I'm a, you know, who are you? What goes into the mix of who you are? So I'm going to give you a minute now to just write that down. You should have gotten a pencil when you came in. If you don't have one, we've got Make some friends. over here. Yep. So let's just take a minute and do that. I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds to write down. Doesn't have to be a big essay. Could just be a little self description. Thank you. Okay. Get out of 
Everybody's really studious. I like this. I know. I like it. Everybody's super <laughs> focused. Okay. I think we're just about ready. Just write down your final thoughts. Not, not an autobiography. Just literally a couple sentences. Whatever comes to your mind does not have to be like a big tome. Okay. Now what I'd like to ask you to do is turn to somebody sitting next to you. Do not get up, but turn in your chair to somebody sitting around you, ideally somebody you don't know and haven't met, and share with each other what's on your card. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do that. <laughs> Try to reach out to somebody you don't know. I'm, just, I'm having Camille come up now. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> You're gonna get your. Okay. And now we're gonna. Beautiful. It's yeah. fresh. Wow. Gorgeous. I it love it. So it smells good too. What? Oh wow! Them. You make them. Yeah. yeah. And don't they smell amazing? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. talking to each other. It's awesome. Uh, um, so we're going to wind it down. Talking to you, Carl. Thank you. <laughs> talking to my partner, who's the one person who stood up when I said, don't stand up. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right. And, and I will say, tease again that afterwards, we're going to have some snacks in the lobby uh, cooked by the, uh, a restaurant owned by a multiracial chef. So, you know, keep up these conversations afterward. Um, before we move on, I want to introduce Camille Sieverling. She was part of our first ever episode of this series. She lives in San Francisco. She is a business owner and an amazing lady. And we wanted Camille and Jen to come up here and share their mixes with each other and the rest of us. Okay. So um, I don't have to read you, this. <laughs> you can just share it with Dr. Jen. Oh. Yeah, you okay. can look at her. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I am... Filipino, black, Spanish, Chinese, some Sioux, and Hawaiian. Woo! Hi. I gave a longer answer, so I did. So what goes into my mix? I said I'm Sri Lankan and African American, but I also said what goes into my mix is spice and flavor, <laughs> resilience and resistance, pride and more pride, and music, dancing, and all night celebrations. Thank you both so much for being here and being part of this. I'll take these. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go. Okay. Yeah, so speaking of dance, thank you for that segue, Dr. Jen. We have a really exciting next segment for you. We have dancer Megan Lowe, who's going to be here with us tonight. She is an incredible dancer, choreographer, singer. I mean, what does the woman not do? She is so multi-talented. She is going to share excerpts from a number of her works, including a recent piece that she's done called Gathering Pieces of Peace, which is about celebrating mixed AAPI identity. And Megan herself is of Chinese and Irish ancestry, and she expresses that through all the different mediums in which she works. So we're super excited to have Megan Lowe enjoy her performance. And we're going to start with a little film clip, and then she's going to come out on the stage. Thank you. 
What are you? Where are you from? No. Where are you really from? I mean, what is your ethnic background? As a half Chinese, half Irish person who doesn't particularly look like either, I have been hearing these questions my entire life. To this day, I still find these questions a bit irksome, but I feel compelled to answer them. I want people to know who I am and for them to stop guessing. Growing up, mixed. Uh, sometimes I think about it, and it's like I was kind of like a chameleon of sorts, and always like adapting to these environments, the environments that were really never quite my own. You know, I learned these useful skills to survive and thrive like in this world um, that kind of belong to other people. When it came to my sense of identity, I realized that these skills that I thought were part of my identity probably were some of the very things that were keeping me from discovering who I was. Identity, as I go through life trying to figure that out and connect with it, can be used to influence the mixed culture. And that I found to be empowering. Self, a longing to belong, I continue my journey to deepen my connections with my Asian American heritage and communities. Just because it is simple doesn't mean it's not meaningful. There is power, there are stories, and they move through my soul. It might seem like it's simple but no one knows just how deep it goes. Every hour, every moment, every breath that it took. We are all here in spite of, despite the doubts and the fear. We are all here through chaos, through turmoil, through moments unclear. We are all here. We are all here. We are all here. We are all here, are all here. so Just because it is simple doesn't mean it's not meaningful. There is wisdom, there are histories, 
and they move through our souls. It might seem like it's simple, but no one knows just how deep it goes. Every elder, every parent, every step that they took, we are all here, ancestors, in my bones I can feel. We are all here, through care and through love, their songs I can hear. We are all here, we are all here, we are all here, we are all here. This is my grandmother's favorite chair. It's very delicate. And this is a drawing that my grandmother made of her favorite chair. I inherited both of these objects from her when she passed away in 2016. This is a big old stick that I'm gonna be dancing with in just a moment. It's about six feet long. And all of these objects have a story behind them. But I'll have to share that with you another time because what I'd like to tell you about today is the origins of my first and currently only tattoo. When I was 14 years old, I took a college level art history class and in one of the sections, we were studying woodblock printing and its origins in China. I designed and carved this elaborate stamp of a lotus flower and a dragonfly, and I thought to myself, if I still love this when I turn 18, I'll get a tattoo of it. And on my 18th birthday, I got this tattoo here with youthful humor I thought it would be meaningful as someone who's only half Chinese to just get the first Chinese character for peace. Hua by itself can mean peace, but is more commonly interpreted as with or some or and. I grew up with not very many Chinese speaking or reading folks around me, but when I went to college at UC Berkeley, I was suddenly surrounded by a lot of people who did read and speak Chinese. And I remember this shift in having such pride in my tattoo uh, to feeling really self-conscious about it. I imagine folks asking me like, why do you have the symbol for and on your back? And not wanting to have to explain myself, I started covering it up. I still sometimes think about getting that second Chinese character together with the first. Despite those thoughts, I also have this desire to stay true to the story of my tattoo and this really clear choice that I made to symbolize my experiences. As a mixed race person, it's sometimes hard for me to feel historically rooted or expert in cultural expression. Nonetheless, I continue to fuse together my explorations of identity with community building and art making. I am embracing that this is how I was born, Chinese and Irish, a mixture of things, and that these experiences are what make me who I am today.
questions I mean obviously you are a multidisciplinary artist and you use a lot of different you know ways to tell this I'm curious though movement dance like what what can you say there that maybe you can't always express in words I feel like for me dance is a way that I can communicate things without without saying things and, and you know what there's so much I can say about this particular topic um, but I would like to um, share with you one specific example that I feel like gets to the heart of what you're saying or what you're asking me. And um, the film that you saw um, was experts from a film I made in 2021 called Maja. And all of, the, all of the rehearsals, all of the filming took place on site. Like I didn't do one single in-studio rehearsal. And so it was very much in community with the people who were there that I was sharing space with. Right. And one of my, my favorite things is in Portsmouth Square, which is the second half of the film, which you didn't see today, um, there was this group of elders that would always be hanging out at Portsmouth Square. Of course, it's Portsmouth Square, right? Doing, yeah. <laughs> doing their exercises. And every time I would go to Portsmouth Square to like work on my dancing, they would be there. And um, we didn't speak the same language, but every time we saw each other, we'd wave at each other with like friendly recognition. I would show them some cool moves. They would show me some of their cool moves. Sometimes I would kind of join them and try out some of their exercises with them. And it was just, it was such a beautiful way of connecting and being in community with one another without necessarily having the, this shared language mm -hmm. to express and be in community. So, via dance, via movement, via sharing space, um, was the way that we were able to connect at that moment. And I found that really powerful and, and meaningful. Yeah. I mean, finally, you lead your own dance company. What does that mean, do you think, to you and your dancers? Like, you're trying to break some long-standing norms in this world. What, like, how is that different, you know, for the people you work with than maybe a traditional dance company? Um, I do feel like for me in the starting of, 
Um, Megan Lowe Dances is, um, I've worked with a lot of really wonderful dance companies in the Bay Area, and there's, there's things that I've learned through them, things that I love, and I'm like, you know what, I wanna keep that tradition going. And then there's things, um, especially when it comes to the way um, artists are treated, that I would love to change. And so that was really one of the main things that propelled me forward into starting to make my own work with a group of people, is I wanted to create environments where people felt really respected, really um, invited to share what they wanted to share, participate in the ways that they wanted to participate, give opportunities for them to really give it their all and, and show what they could do best, but also really give them opportunities um, to dive into things that they're interested in, not necessarily expert in, and use that as a, a moment to grow together and become stronger together and build community together. Um, and I can also go on and on about yeah. that, <laughs> but I know we have a lot well, of really yeah. awesome things going on today. Well, um, we're so happy you came today, and I think I might speak for everybody when I say I hope you never change your tattoo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel a, a newfound conviction in this tattoo. It might need a little refresh. refresh. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, but there's also one more thing I just wanted to mention in relationship to the dance community. Yeah. Um, the, there is a big um, a strike going on today, that a call to action from the dance community um, in the Bay Area. And um, there are a lot of dance folks who are out there on the streets right now um, striking against um, uh, the terrible stuff that's going on in Gaza and calling for a ceasefire. And I do feel like, as someone who's part of the dance community, that I just wanted to draw attention to that, um, that there are things that need some big changing in this world and that dancers are taking action um, to hopefully propel that change forward. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Just one second here. All right, well, I am very excited for our next storyteller. Cheyenne Barefoot is a KQED colleague of ours. She's a social video producer here at KQED. More importantly, she is a storyteller. Uh, she's a photographer, and she is hosting Sovereign Innovations, which is a show for indigenous youth from PBS New Mexico. And uh, I am excited to welcome her to Sage. Cheyenne Barefoot, everybody. Before fifth grade, I hadn't really given much thought to being mixed. I can remember the exact day that I gained this level of consciousness. It was at my fifth grade volleyball tournament. My teammates and I were huddled outside just chatting about typical fifth grade girl things. Like the Rolling Stones, and how none of them had ever heard of the greatest band of all time. The band that blasted through the speakers of my mom's behemoth blue eight-seater Chevy Suburban. Unbelievable! Somehow we landed on the subject of me being Native American, a fact that they were absolutely gobsmacked to learn. Then why are you this? Why, why am I what? <sighs> this. Well, I, I don't. <sighs> if you're Native American, why are you this color? Oh, well, I'm part white too. It was at this moment that I realized that how I perceive myself may not necessarily be how others perceive me. Now, to reduce myself to my pigment, or lack thereof, is to limit my identity and experiences to my appearance. And I'm so much more than the way I look. I'm Chiricahua Apache on my dad's side, and some type of blue-ass white devil on my mom's side. 
And I could say that I mixed because my parents were, at one point, really passionate and loved each other very much. But it goes beyond that. See, to understand my identity, we need to go back to the beginning. In 1492, some meathead named Columbo or something had an inferiority complex and zero sense of direction and landed here in Turtle Island. <laughs> and from there, you know what happens. Genocide. Centuries and centuries of different white men coming to Turtle Island, caravanning across it with their white families, nearly and sometimes fully, wiping out entire indigenous tribes. And before somebody says, uh, you guys were fighting each other before, you guys were total savages. Intertribal conflict is not the same as planned systemic genocide at the hands of the United States government. We weren't trying to wipe each other out. Also, what a double standard that is, because white people have been fighting each other since the beginning of time. But I don't hear y'all calling that white on white crime or whatever. As the centuries continued, Colonizers found new ways to exterminate us, but we fought back each time. One of those ways was Indian residential schools. You know, that piece of history you definitely learned about in school. Oh no. Ugh. The United States government, in collaboration with the Christian and Catholic churches, funded a program that violently removed indigenous children from their homes and put them in these schools where they were emotionally, physically, and sexually abused in an effort to kill the Indian and save the man. My great-grandmother went to one of these schools, and when she had a daughter, she didn't know how to love her. She'd had no template. And when that daughter gave birth to my dad, she didn't know how to love him either. This trickle-down effect, intergenerational trauma, has heavily influenced how my siblings and I were raised. In an opposite world, my mom's family led a very different ancestral legacy. She was born in Santa Monica, the youngest of two. Her father was an alcoholic ad man and a brilliant writer. But I would never get to meet him because he died of a heart attack when she was 13. And this, left my stay-at-home Nana to re-enter the working world in a desperate attempt to keep her family afloat. And while my uncle was busy carving his path with the wrong crowd that would eventually lead his sensitive soul to die of a cocaine overdose, my mom completed her childhood dream of being an elephant trainer at what was formerly known as Marine World. Starting as young as 16, my mom worked in the film and entertainment industry as an animal trainer and rubbed elbows with the likes of Michael Jackson, whose elephant, by the way, saved her from another elephant a few years later, but you're going to have to see me after to hear that story. <laughs> My parents met on the fair circuit. She was running a chimpanzee photo booth, and he was selling wooden flowers that he carved. I am not making this up. And the fact that their paths, the paths of a white woman and an indigenous man, crossed is a result of colonization. But their partnership isn't necessarily a form of colonial violence. That was something different. I'm not an only child. I share the middle spot in the barefoot family with my twin sister, Kiowa, and together we form a quartet of bare feet. We grew up in Tracy, California, where indigenous people are few and far between. Basically, people's only reference as to what we looked like was a commercial of an Italian man in a wig crying about people littering. <laughs> so sad, all the litter. Now, my older sister leaned into her indigeneity super young, basically opting not to recognize her whiteness. She was incredibly prideful and almost obsessive about outwardly portraying that she was native. She suntanned religiously, and she mostly opted to wear her hair in braids. Now, the racial ambiguity is something my younger brother, Sequoia, loves. He's a social chameleon. He loves that nobody really knows what he is. However, I also think he was really vocal about his internalized racism, and growing up, he often idolized a lot of people from races that weren't his. 
my twin sister Kiowa didn't have internalized racism. She just didn't know what race was. And one day she announced that when she grew up, she was going to be Japanese. We watched a lot of anime, so I think that definitely informed her opinion. <laughs> Now, one thing that stands out about growing up mixed is how we were and continue to be fetishized, even from a really young age, by whole adults. I remember this one time, I was walking out of Walmart with my mom, and at this point, I had hair that was about down to here. And this white lady comes up behind me, and she runs her hand down the whole length of my hair. Ugh. My older sister had really strange interactions at high school speech and debate tournaments, with competitors commenting on how aggressively native she looked. And Kaiwa gets a lot of attention for her alternative appearance and name, once people figure out how to pronounce it. What are you? I've never seen anybody that looks like you. And at least one point in our lives, we've all been called exotic. Or Mexican. <laughs> and while some kids got family vacations and endless amounts of affirmation and uh, all that jazz, we got our parents' unresolved trauma. My mom and dad separated in July of 2020 after I graduated college. She left our Central Valley home for Oregon, and my brother and I fled to another part of town. My dad was abusive because, you know, intergenerational trauma, which is a fact I didn't share with anyone until I was 16 because I was constantly told what happens in this house stays in this house. And although we had consistent financial stability, my dad couldn't really give us the one thing that we all wanted, unconditional love. There was always a power play present. And I've struggled with taking ownership of my identity, the part of me that I get from him. And I'm, I'm so proud of being indigenous, but for years I couldn't separate him from that. And because of that, family means something very different to me. All my life I've cobbled together chosen family, uncles, sisters, brothers, cousins, to form a Frankenstein family. Not exactly whole, but not exactly not whole. When I was a little girl, Whiteness was sold to me. It was in the shows I watched on TV. It was in the bands that I listened to, in the community that surrounded me. Indigenous representation was absent. Good indigenous representation didn't exist. And funny enough, growing up, I watched a lot of Westerns because my dad liked them. Our favorite part was when the cowboys shot the Indians. Oh, that didn't land? <laughs> Seriously, though, we were always portrayed as the savages. White women were always playing indigenous women. White men were always playing indigenous men. I couldn't relate to the lack of visibility and the fake representation. And actually, I had a hard time connecting to that part of me in general. I was aware that I was Native, but I felt so misunderstood by my peers and disconnected from my culture. By the time I became an angsty preteen, I was committed to the idea that in order to be successful, I had to be white, because that was all that was shown to me. And I was so set on this idea that By seventh grade, I decided that when I got older, I was going to change my name, I was going to stay pale, and I was never going to talk about being native. Being mixed offered me an opportunity to favor one identity over the other in order to fulfill my assumptions. But this wasn't for the best. It wasn't until my freshman year of college that I started to reconnect with my indigenous identity, and I initially felt so fake, because of how long I pushed it down. Was I also just a white woman playing an indigenous woman? I wrote an essay about indigenous representation in the media, and I explained how I felt all those many years ago, about how I felt when I didn't see myself on the screen 
about the impacts of these stereotypical representations on indigenous youth and about how we occupy less than half of indigenous representation, both good and bad, on the screen. My professor hadn't read anything like it. I felt so proud and I felt important for shedding light on this topic. And I kept up this momentum throughout the rest of my college career, despite feeling like a big imposter the entire time. Now, the reconnection process isn't a linear one, and my reconnection journey has been <laughs> humbling. Um, and although I was so, so nervous, so nervous of being around other indigenous people for fear of not being accepted, for fear of not being viewed as native enough because I was also white, my experience has actually been quite the opposite. I attended community gatherings. <laughs> like the Indigenous Red Market at Oak in, in, in Oakland, excuse me, um, the Stanford Pow Wow, I've been to the Alcatraz Sunrise Gathering, I've listened to community leaders and elders speak, and I've continued to talk about Indigenous issues in my place of work and in my friend groups. By surrounding myself with other Indigenous and mixed folks, it's allowed me to forge new connections and build long-lasting relationships and really push through those negative feelings that I used to associate with my mixed identity. I realize now that my dad doesn't have ownership of my indigeneity. I do. And being mixed doesn't make me any less indigenous. And sure, there's some gatekeepers out there who will never be happy but I like to think that 13-year-old Shy would be proud. And now I'm the host of my very own show with PBX New Mexico called Sovereign Innovations. And there I'm actively pushing back against the way people view indigenous and mixed identities. And I'm helping other folks like me other understand that they don't have to accept the colonizer and colonized as our final narrative. I'm offering a new kind of indigenous representation, the type I needed as a little mixed girl, so she could see that people like her existed, that they had similar experiences and relationships. Most people see Native Americans like this, a world full of spiritual, red-skinned, buckskin-clad Indians living in teepees. But like, that's so outdated. I mean, where's the rest of the story? You know, the ones your history books are raised and the TVs rarely show? Join me, Cheyenne Barefoot, an enrolled member of the Chiricahua Apache Nation, and I'll show you the world full of indigenous excellence. A world where innovation and tradition weave as one, where powwows and pop culture dance together, and where our ingenuity is a powerful tool for cultural resilience. Meet indigenous designers infusing culture into fashion, historians using beadwork as data sovereignty, and architects taking cultural knowledge to build community. This is the world of sovereign innovations. Because when you look at a screen, you should be able to see yourself represented. Thank you. Thank you, Cheyenne. That was incredible. Cheyenne Barefoot, everybody. She's awesome. So we obviously just heard a lot about how isolating and lonely it can feel if you don't feel connected to your parents or they don't get the experience of being mixed. Our next guests are taking the exact opposite approach, making sure they talk about hard things with each other and connect with their kids. We are gonna have W. Kamau Bell up on the stage. He is a comedian and an author. You might have watched him host CNN's United Shades of America. His latest book is You Do the Work, an anti-racist activity book. Melissa Hudsonbell is a dancer, choreographer, teacher, and teacher. And Kamau and Melissa actually recently founded Who Knows Best Productions in Oakland. Kamau and Melissa and their three daughters all appear in their new Max film, 1000% Me, Growing Up Mixed. Let's have a little look. 
never really had anyone ask me, what are you or like what's your skin tone. If someone did ask me, I would probably say I'm mixed. I'm half Pakistani and I'm half African American. I'm Asian and American. Filipino American. Black and white and both. Half black and half Japanese. A thousand percent of person. Do people ever confuse what your race is? I get everything but what I am, pretty much. Every single day. Just because we live in a diverse community does not mean that racism and all that doesn't happen. A high percentage of interracial couples have no idea what the experience is for this child that they brought into the world. I would go to the park with Kanani all the time, and the kids got in a little something, and the mother said to me, well, Pika, you know, it's because Kanani doesn't speak English. I had no idea that kids were given a lesson about race so young. I'm really proud of the current and future generation of mixed kids that are being loud and proud. Our kids have been instruments of healing. Is there anything you think us non-mixed race people need to know about mixed race people? It's not being less of one culture. It's having the opportunity to have a deeper connection to more cultures. If I asked you what ingredients to mix you up? Black, Asian, and love. And a llama and a corgi. <laughs> Everybody, let's welcome Kamau and Melissa Bell to the stage. Hey guys, hey guys. Thank you so much for coming. We loved our podcast episode with you, and it's so exciting to have you on the stage tonight to talk about 1000% Me. So you guys are not mixed, but you are the parents of three mixed race kids who appear in this film. What brought you to this documentary project? What made you want to sit down with a bunch of kids and be like, what is it like? Yeah, the hardest <laughs> interview subjects in the world, by the way. If you've ever tried to interview a kid, it's, it's impressive what y'all got out of them. <laughs> I mean, it, they weren't hard. What we did actually is we sat me like on the ground so they could look me in the eye. Nice. That worked a lot. Idea. Try to meet kids on their level. Was this coming out of like conversations at home? Yeah, and I think just both of us recognizing that our experiences were going to be really different from these kids' experiences and wanting to hold a space for them and for that and then by extension for other folks, especially here in the Bay Area, a lot of our friends uh, and their friends are mixed race and it was just a, a great mm -hmm. opportunity to get to hear from them in a really different way. Yeah. I mean, Kamau, I'm interested, like, you talk to people for a living, you do this type of thing. What did you learn from the kids about these conversations and, and how to ask the questions to actually elicit honest responses? I mean, I think the sort of the important thing when you talk about this film is that it, we didn't know what it was when we started it. Mm. So it was 2020. There was this moment of a racial reckoning. Remember that? Oh. Yeah, it was a moment. And there was a moment where media companies were like, how do we do this better? And I had a meeting with HBO about that. And HBO actually was like, we've heard you talk about your mixed race kids in your act. Would you ever think about doing something about mixed race people? And so that was really the, like we had certainly, I'd always had mixed race people say with United Shades, when are you going to talk about the mixed race experience? But I really felt like United Shades is really lives in a space of trauma. Mm. And having mixed race kids, it's not like they're not hard conversations, obviously, but I didn't want to do something that felt like it was trauma based. And this is a really joyful film. It's yeah, really it's, joyful. yeah, certainly as we yeah. talk about, I mean, I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that in the first minute of the film, one of the parents says, what is white culture other than uh, racism and Christian evangelicals? <laughs> and that's in the kids film. <laughs> and so we definitely hit some hard things in there, but it, we didn't know what it was. And so a lot of the filming was really a test shoot to just see if there was anything here. Mm. And, and that's really the core of the film. We walked out of it and we're like, I think we're almost done. <laughs> so it really ended up being like, just uh, we had a great producer who reached out to, to cultural organizations. We started in the Bay. We thought we might go around the country, but after that first weekend of shoots, we were like, no, I think we're, this is the core of the film is these kids. And then it was like, you sort of wanted to feel like, where did these, where did these kids that we've met come from? And that's mm -hmm. how we sort of started talking to the parents and other community members. Mm -hmm. Melissa, one of the things that really struck me watching this film is that there are several moments when kids with white moms say, my mom really doesn't get it. <laughs> and I wonder for you, 
in the course of making this film, but also in the course of parenting, sure. like what have you come away with in terms of how to have these discussions and also how to recognize like your kids' lived experience is not the same as yours? I mean, I've been in a relationship with this guy for going on 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And it's always been part of the conversation. And so I think just um, learning and absorbing so much about the way that Kamau lives and moves in the world and being in these rooms and in these conversations um, opened my eyes incredibly to uh, the experience of, that he was having and to the conversations around race that I didn't grow up having as much, you know, certainly not as much. And so I think once we got serious and once we got married, there was a whole different level of conversations. And then certainly once kids got in the mix, there was a whole different level of conversations. But I think uh, really prioritizing kind of a, a radical honesty and like an openness to their experiences, like being really curious about what that is and leaving the space for them to express themselves and like not to try to pretend in it at any time right. that I have the answers like, well, some people believe this and some people believe this and we think this and what do you think, you know, and trying to um, leave it this kind of open forum where they can feel like they can talk about anything. All right. Well, one of the things you guys talked about is something near and dear to me. We want to watch another clip here. <laughs> talk about hair. Mm. What do you think about your hair? Um, I like my hair. You like your hair? Uh, right now I like it because I put gel in it, so I'll go to the side. And I like that it's curly. What do you think about your hair? I, I, love, I love it. My hair. I love my hair. I've had dreads since the beginning of the pandemic. My mom was like, this pandemic's not gonna last a while. Let's just do something fun. Now it's not so fun for her. <laughs> Because it takes like three hours for her to do it now. And <laughs> she's just regretting never doing it. I love my hair. I love how curly it is. And I love how many styles I can have it in. I love how I can have it big and poofy or in beads or out hair or freedom hair. I can have clicky clacks where I have all beads. And I'm really thankful that my mom can do all these types of hair because it takes a while. My mom, Martha, is like the hair person. She does not have curly hair, and so she did a lot of research. She watched a ton of videos and all that, and she is a, like, she loves doing my hair, and she can spend hours on it. Mine gets really tangled easily. It just feels like all over the place, and that's kind of like what I like about it. I have a lot of hair. When you take it out, it's a lot of hair. It's humongous and I don't know how my mom gets into a ponytail I have no idea my brothers have very different type of hair like they'll take like a couple minutes doing their hair until Ibrahim Ibrahim takes so long to make his hair because he keeps on talking about his waves because he got new waves and now he keeps on talking about it. What made you decide to do your hair this way? We have long hair to stay in touch with our indigenous side. What do you have to do to get your hair ready? Brush it hard. It's painful. So, so painful. My Japanese mother did her best to deal with my big, big wild hair. It just seemed like the other girls had like long Garnier Frutis. <laughs> luscious hair and I was like why my hair doesn't flow like that hair can be an emotional topic <laughs> um, and has a lot of different meanings for all of us I remember I would go to school and they're like oh my god your hair's in the way like and I'll be like okay so then I would always want to sit in the back but now I don't worry about that anymore like it's my hair and if I want to keep it like that, I could keep it like that. People have definitely touched my hair without my permission. Um, and like, they like, like to run their fingers through it sometimes. And it's like really weird. And sometimes like, if my close friends ask like, hey, like there's something in your hair, can I get it? Like obviously yes. But if it's like a classmate of mine, like is just going through my hair, then I don't really enjoy that, so. When I was little, I wanted hair like yours. I wanted it to be like wavy and long like that. 
But as I got older, I was like, I love my hair. I was just saying, I'm glad you learned to love your hair. I had to learn to love mine, too. Mm -hmm. And seeing hair like Juno's, I had never felt hair like yours until you. I had only felt hair like this. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you ever wish that you three all looked exactly the same, had the nope. same hair? Nope. The same... <laughs> no, 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 not at all. No, nope. <laughs> no nope on a rope. I love that. Just, just yeah. to be clear, that's so we had so much good stuff. That's actually bonus footage. That's not actually yeah. in the film. Uh, and that made me feel so seen. Like, I have to mm. tell you guys, I grew up with a mom with very straight, fine hair, and she did not know what to do with this. And there wasn't YouTube videos. Like, there wasn't products for textured hair. Um, I know we've talked about this before, Melissa, but you have worked really hard to make sure that you can do your kid's hair. Just talk a little bit about that journey. Sure. I was just thinking about it um, as I was watching this film. And um, shout out to the grandmas, by the way, who are both in the audience. So yes. They're <laughs> <somewhere>. Mom. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're both here. Yeah. 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 They're not sitting near each other. <laughs> yeah, we, we just should. Because they didn't arrive I don't know if they together. are. Just <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I, I was just thinking as I was watching the clip, when I had Sammy, I was in the middle of a PhD program, and I say that only because I think I went into hair with the same like <laughs> fervor for research that I did <laughs> with the other things that I was involved in at the time. You know, um, Martha, who we just saw too, is a great friend and sort of a mentor in some ways of like, how do you be a responsible white lady who has kids who are different than you are? And so I, I did. I just went and researched. Um, and I, I think I've told this story before, but the uh, resource that popped up most prevalently and most usefully at the time was called uh, Chocolate Hair Vanilla Care. Yeah. <laughs> it was called Chocolate Hair Vanilla Care. And it was a series of videos, and it had all of these products. And this person um, was a white mom who I believe, I could be wrong here, but I believe had adopted children and like really took it seriously and like tried out a bunch of different products and showed you how to do the things. And you had the combs and the tools and all the stuff and had a bunch of different hairstyles that you could learn how to do. And so that was like one of the really tender ways that Sammy and I got to spend time together when she was really little. She would let me do her hair. It was like the only television yeah. that she got at the time. <laughs> and we would sit together, you know, and, and work it out. Yeah. Mm. Hair came up a lot in our series, also in your film. And then, you know, just this question of appearance overall, there's this moment in the film that I love where there's a family with a black dad and an Asian mom, and they're talking about their kids' socks, yep. right? And how they don't want the daughter to go out with mismatched... Mm -hmm. The dad doesn't, yeah. The dad, yeah, right? The, the, yeah, the, yeah, Bryant Terry, uh, yeah. Area, uh, uh, as everybody is. But uh, he, uh, yeah, didn't want his black daughter to go out with mismatched socks because you don't want to give white supremacy any excuse because white supremacy is coming for you as a black person anyway. Hmm. So he felt really committed to the idea of like, she has to have this, everything's gotta be sort of like, like he's like, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator. I gotta check everything out before you leave the house. <laughs> and, and the mom was sort of confused by it. Yeah, she, while Jadon is Asian, she's also from Berkeley, so. Right. <laughs> there was no judgment anyway. Yeah, 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 so that's what she's wear shoes. Like. Yeah. No judgment, no judgment, so. Uh, so yeah, and they and they say they got into real thick conversations about that, and it's the mm -hmm. kind of thing that like, even if you're in this, you have to know that there's going to be those times where it's like, no, I need this if this is my child, even if it doesn't make sense to you. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that I need for our kid to do, and so certainly, Brian and Jadon, I think in the movie, in many ways, are stand-ins for us. Like we had active conversations from the mm -hmm. moment we met about race and racism. And I will give Melissa her credit because it's not like I was just like, let's talk about racism every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, she, she was like, oh, this is a fun relationship. We often <laughs> had, yeah. Tell me more. Yeah. No, I mean, I think one of our best discussions ever was arguing about whether the movie Avatar was more racist or sexist. Oh, no. <laughs> so, it's always a thin line there. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, but it wasn't a fight. It was like, well, I think clearly it was more, well, I think it was, and we settled both. Um, so yeah, so we were, these are the kind of conversations that we were in, so it wasn't, so, which doesn't mean you solve everything, right. but it me, at least it means you're sort of like, you're, you're more prepared for when your kid comes home with a problem that you're like, yeah, I knew this was coming, or I suspected. It's maybe an obvious instance, but one of the things I think about 
early on in our relationship, we would go somewhere to go in and out of the shops or have lunch at a cafe or something like this. And I had been brought up with like, oh, it's an interesting little shop. Like, let's go in and just spend some time, look around, pick mm -hmm. things up, you know. And I very quickly realized, like, that is part of, of how I spent recreational time that made Kamau feel real uncomfortable. Going into shops and touching stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, people love that. Oh. Let's just yeah. touch stuff. Yeah, this is in what a, we do. Let's in a quaint thing. shop, in a right. quaint shop. And yes, and I, my mom is here, and I have the memory of being like eight years old in a drugstore and being told, if you come in here, don't touch anything unless you're going to buy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that guy's going to be following you around. He's like, who, me? Yeah, you. So, yeah, it's just about being able to have that conversation where I feel like you're actually threatening anything and actually having it in front of your kids, too. That's what I was going to say. Now, we have a different conversation with our kids, right? It's not the conversation that your mom had with you, and it's certainly not the way that I grew up. Just go willy-nilly and touch whatever you want to touch. And, I mean, within reason, I'm <laughs> breaking stuff in the stores. But, like, you know, these things are available for you to enjoy. And with our kids, it's, you know, it's a different, a different thing. Hmm. Has it changed as... They are getting older. Your kids are some of the stars in this film, by the way. They are so amazing. Um, but as the conversation, I mean, as they grow, how does the conversation change? I mean, yeah, our daughter, our oldest daughter, who's in there was 10, and she's 12 now, and 10 to 12 is like oh 30 to 40. In a Big shit. That's right, yeah. Big uh, I know that And well. so she's now at a place where she's hearing more conversations about race. She's having to... She's hearing friends and kids who are around her. They're sort of... It becomes a more open conversation. She, But she has been... So that she's hearing, like... One of her white classmates complained about reverse racism, and she just went like, oh, Jesus. And I was like, yay, we did it. But she's also aware that like, she doesn't, that, the world that, the, the world that we've created for her in her home and in her community is not the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so now she, yeah. Well, just at 12, they start to want more independence. So, you know, she and her friend will go into shops without grown-ups around. And there was one day when she came back and, and she told me uh, they had been on College Avenue in uh, Berkeley, or I guess Berkeley, Oakland, right on the border there, um, in Rockridge. And uh, the person who owned the shop just came up and started touching her. What is with the touching <laughs> hair? It's yeah. driving me so crazy. Yeah, and she's a 12-year-old. And so, you know, just yeah. the power dynamic, like everything in that moment. And we were able to talk about that moment like, whoa, like that was all the things, right, that we've talked about or, you know, mm -hmm. and how was it different for you when me and Dada weren't around? Like, what was that like? What did you do? You know, and she had to explain to her friend when they left, like, that was really weird. And the friend was not black and, like, didn't catch it in the same way. And, you know, just she's yeah. having her own interface with the world. Yeah, it doesn't involve us. I'm curious, like, as you said, you shot this in the Bay Area. Like, your kids, our kids are all growing up surrounded by multiracial people in a way that, you know, was not the case when we were kids. Um, but this is on HBO Max. I mean, it's everywhere. Like, what has the reaction been from around the country? What, how, anything good, bad, ugly, what, what's it been? <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody thinks it's perfect. Oh, yeah. Um, just, just like they do with all my you're work. you're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> They're always like, nothing's, no Nothing notes. Are, no <laughs> so I remember when it was about to come out, I think Sammy asked... Right when it did come out, are there people who don't like the film? Yeah. I was like, yeah. And she, I was sort of like, yeah, there are. What, what, they don't like, what don't they like about it? And I was like, look, we made this thing. It cannot cover every aspect of everybody's mixed experience. There are also people who are just haters. There are also people who hate me, so anything I do is bad. And so I think one of the big things we had to talk about was like, what does this expose our kids to? They are not on, so, they are not on social media. Uh, they don't have smartphones. But just knowing that it's out in the world and knowing that all these families trusted us with their stories, I feel really protective of all these yeah. people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was a thing this week with a post on KQED that was about the thing. And suddenly people started to fight it out in the comments. And I, and I had to reach out and be like, I can't, for, the, for my kids, for my family, for the people who are part of this, I can't let this be, the, I can't let this be a part of the conversation mm -hmm. in this way. And I think that, like, I, I was thinking about this earlier, like, how these conversations are super important, but they're also super important that they're focused and you invite the people who want to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. I think the era of, so I think often if the film, if the trailer's just out there in the world, it's just floating around and nobody has the context around it, then they can make up whatever narrative they want. They're never going to watch it. And then it just sort of becomes more, more, more divisive chaff. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, so I will say that. So that is a part of it. But overwhelmingly, I have heard from people, and I hear from people regularly, and Melissa speaks to this, who the film means something to them. And what I hear about is the conversations after the film. We really worked to make it an hour. We could have made it longer. HBO didn't care. But I really felt like the important thing is what happens when the film is over and you turn to the people in the room, and especially if you're a mixed Kids, family. Kids, yeah. And, yeah, and have it. the conversations yeah. about what that actually, what you got out of it, what you didn't get out of it, what would you do differently. I think that's the most valuable part of the film. Well, and if you're a kid not living in the Bay Area, if you're living somewhere else where there aren't a lot of mixed families and you actually get to see yourself represented on screen. Yeah. I mean, that could be transformational. Really yeah, so, I mean, I, I, people, somebody just asked backstage, are we going to make a sequel? That's not really, it's I mean, you know, <laughs> not, not a Marvel we movie. We solved racism. So, yeah, yeah. So, it didn't, <laughs> I don't know if it broke, so I don't know what, but the fact we got to make one and it mainstream the conversation is important, and I hope that there are other people, and there are other people who make these films, and I hope that all it can do is be another sort of, like, piece of this discussion yeah. and can invite other people to make their version of it. Awesome. Well, I encourage everybody here to check it out. It's an amazing film. You can check it out on Max. It's called A Thousand Percent Me, which that adorable kid coined. Miles, Miles name. Right? Did you guys figure out that was the title, like, right away after he said no, it? No. It's funny. It took months. We had a lot of bad titles. Mm-hmm. I mean, bad titles. Not bad, but right just sort here. of like, blah. Not a, not so, good. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Let the kids name it. Yeah. All right. Come on, guys. Thank Come you on, Melissa so Bell. Much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, you guys. All right. I'm up now. So I can pass for a lot of things. Um, I don't actually usually know what assumptions people make about me in the world. My sister and I always joke that when we're traveling places like Latin America, the Mediterranean region, everyone assumes we're from like the next country over. Um, They know we're not from there. Um, And it's funny because as mixed folks, I think we all know that we're members of many clubs, but sometimes it's hard, as we've talked about again and again tonight, to claim any of them because you're not 100% one of them. So it's a feeling I know a lot of people share here, and it's a theme that obviously came up a lot as we did this series, and it's really sort of rooted in this desire to be enough, to feel validated claiming all of our parts, not having to explain our fractions, our hair, our names which is Marisa, by the way, Um, to stand up here and simply say, I am Mexican, Armenian, Norwegian, English, Irish. I don't have to choose. So for me, food has been one of the entry points to claiming my wholeness. Um, My great-grandparents on my mother's side fled Armenia in the early 1900s before the genocide. This is my uh, great-grandpa uh, Mike, um, he, they settled in Fresno, where my great-grandfather opened a barber shop, and they raised three kids. Uh, Grandpa Mike died a long time before I was born, but my great-grandmother Annie, a spitfire of a woman, you can see her here at age 11 with her sister Martha, um, she was all of four foot 11, and she lived well into my childhood. And it was through her cooking that I actually found the most connection growing up to my ancestors. Rolling sarma, Armenian grape leaves stuffed with ground lamb and rice and onions and tomato paste and parsley was a, basically a rite of passage in my family. At holidays and other family gatherings, Grandma Annie would hold court with her tiny knobby hand, showing everybody the correct amount of filling and the right way to roll those little bite-sized tastes of America, or Armenia, excuse me. Um, It was sort of this rite of passage even for folks who entered the family by marriage. And it remains a veritable test in the Abkarian family. How good is your Sarma roll? I'm happy to report my husband, who, by the way, is Irish, Ecuadorian, Puerto Rican, uh, is an expert at this, despite entering the family a long time after Grandma Annie died, and it might have something to do with him being a cannabis editor. Um, But to me, these are the taste of home. Almost burnt butter, rich, melt-in-your-mouth lamb, tart grape leaves, sweet, eggy biscuits. Um... And it, some of those tastes, sorry, I skipped a line here, but, um, were other things that you know, we made as well, uh, in addition to the sarma, kufta, uh, meatballs mixed with bulgur, sweet chowed egg bread, and the crown jewel, which every child loves no matter what their background, rice pilaf. But of course, I am not just Armenian. 
My grandmothers, who both died when I was a child, traced their heritage back to Western Europe. My grandma Jan, you can see her here with my Papa Dick, Annie's son, was English, Irish, and Norwegian. Her family were early white European-American settlers, and her great or great-great-uncle, it's a little unclear, Edward Winslow was one of the first governors uh, in Massachusetts. Um, I don't really remember Grandma Jan talking a lot, though, about her family or family traditions. Grandma Norma, my dad's mom, was tall and fair. Her mother, Clara, emigrated from Norway. And my memories of Grandma Norma are pretty faint. She had Parkinson's and um, declined when I was a kid and passed away. But we do carry on one Norwegian tradition, which is uh, Yulikaga. It is a sweet Christmas loaf. Do not call it fruit bread. It's a little better. <laughs> And my mom, the baker in the family, actually carried this tradition on as I, when I was a kid. Um, she is the one who is in the kitchen doing these things, um, carrying on her long deceased mother-in-law's heritage. And my dad still loves to toast them and slather it with butter. That brings me to Norma's husband, Dionisio, who you see here, my Papa Nicho, my Mexican grandfather, who I love and miss so much and who I think of constantly as I continue to sort out how and whether and when to claim my own Mexicanness. As I continually struggle with Spanish, as I work to introduce my own children to life south of the border, and as I teach myself now to cook the dishes that I didn't learn from him, or in large part, his part side of the family. Uh, my grandfather grew up in a Mexican family in Brooklyn. His grandfather, Manuel Iglesias de Pazos, came to Mexico from Spain, and he spent time in Cuba before going, uh, learning to roll cigars before going to Veracruz, Mexico, where he met his wife, Magdalena. We don't know her full story, but we know that she did trace her ancestry to Africa. We believe they went back to Cuba together, and then eventually the family moved to Florida and then New York, where my grandpa, Papa Nicho, grew up. From what I've been told, my grandfather spent a lot of time defending his family with his fists as a child. And after World War II, where he served as an army cook, he settled here in San Francisco, married my Norwegian grandmother, and set out successfully to assimilate. I don't think it was about being white per se, but about raising kids that were unassailably American. It was probably a reaction to the discrimination that he faced. Out of his siblings, he and his sister, my great aunt V, had the darkest skin and probably presented as the most Mexican in the family. Here they are as young adults. I love this photo. Papa Nietzsche would not speak Spanish to us, even after my sister became fluent. He was an excellent folk dancer. It was a passion he shared with my grandmother. But more broadly, it was felt to me like he kind of erased his Mexican heritage. Um, and I think it was because he was working to make sure his kids didn't face the same things he did. The only thing I remember him cooking as a kid is Spam, which is clearly not Mexican. It was left over from his days as an army cook. And all of this was really confusing to me. A girl with curly, curly hair named Marisa Lagos, who grew up in San Diego an hour from the border and spent much of her childhood going not to her Mexican grandfather's beach house in Mexico, but her Armenian grandfather's beach house. <laughs> you know, and as I grew older, my curves hinted at my melting pot of a Mexican background, which we now know does include Spanish, indigenous, and African bloodlines, and who, as I said, after years of studying and taking classes and traveling abroad, still has completely broken Spanish. I now know that this confusion does not just belong to me. My dad's cousin, Carla, who's here tonight and helped me immensely with these family photos and history, reached out after hearing our mixed series on the radio and expressed her own ambivalence, one generation apart, the same exact feelings. Looking Mexican, not speaking Spanish, not knowing what to say on those damn forms. Are we white? Are we Hispanic? Are we just posers? Like, I don't know, feeling in her case, like her New York cousins were way more connected to their Mexicanness than those of us just hours from Mexico here in California because they were part of a big Spanish-speaking family still. Carla Gallo gave me a gift she may not even know. When I got married a little over a decade ago, my best friend made a book of recipes. And on page 52, Carla contributed Abuelita and Aunt V's Cuban black beans. It starts with the instructions, Aunt Virginia always says, the more you stir the beans, the better they will be. If you don't stir them enough, they will be parados, standing up. 
Creamy beans, beans that are one with the sauce, were the only acceptable one in Aunt B's reality. It's a simple recipe, just a few ingredients. I don't always even make the sufrito, don't tell Aunt V. But in a way, she says it's okay. Uh, Aunt V is her mom. Um, but in a way, these few paragraphs accompanied by a photo of Abuelita, my great-grandmother, Magdalena, and Manuel's daughter, offered me a roadmap I didn't have before then. It's one that's helped me find my Mexican inside, and I think to start healing some of would have must have been really deep wounds inside my grandfather to make him want to distance himself from this. I am learning that I do not need permission or somebody else to teach me to embrace this part of myself. So this year, for the second year in a row, I made an ofrenda for Dia de los Muertos. On it are pictures, and these are my two boys, one of them's here tonight. On it are pictures of Papa Nicho, Aunt V, Grandma Annie, and our entire mixed up family my husband's Irish father and Ecuadorian grandfather, my Armenian, my Mexican, my English, Irish, my Norwegian families. It's not the only Mexican tradition I've decided to claim. Food remains at the core of how my family celebrates and a big way that I've learned how to show my love. And I have decided to teach myself to make enchiladas suizas, chili verde, tacos de pescado, to last year for the first time ever, bring my family together, and make Christmas tamales. As I share these new slash old traditions with my boys, I hope it makes it a little easier for them to claim all those parts of themselves, because truly all of it belongs to them. Thank you. and we are getting to the food portion. It's coming right up. Um, but we wanted to do one more thing with you guys. Marisa just talked about food and recipes as a way that we can connect with our heritages. So you have one more card on your seat. It's the card with the yellow border. And it has a question for you about the flavors that remind you of growing up in your family. So we just wanted you to take a second. It could be like ingredients or spices or dishes or things you had in your kitchen. Like what, what is your family's unique blend? Um, I'll just give an example that one of the powerhouses behind this show, Joan Martinez, who's uh, behind the scenes, she is uh, Chinese and Mexican and Native American and she always talks about like rice. Here she is, Joan. She always talks fried. about like fried rice and pinto beans being like the flavor of her family. Um, so just whatever it is for you, take a second, fill that out, and then we're gonna do a little activity in a sec. So just, I'm gonna give you a minute. Should we skip the share part and just go straight? We're skipping the share part, just having two people share. Your mic on. All right, now instead of turning to your neighbor, I'd rather just hear from a couple of you in the audience. We've got some microphones. Raise your hand. Who wants, Who wants to, to share, share what See, they wrote? Right there. Yeah. <laughs> She's coming. Yawn's coming. Oh, there she is. Oh, where? Right here. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was going to say gumbo. Nice. Nice. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> No, that's good. We have <laughs> right, one more. Here. Anybody else? Oh, we got one. Um, rice, soy sauce, vinegar, and barbecue sauce. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I love Let's it. Let's just do one more. One more. Down here. I see somebody in the front. Ooh, you got yours. Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> A whole bunch of flavors, but the two dishes that always stand in mind, uh, shrimp and pork potstickers and kusa rice, which is uh, stuffed squash. Yeah. Awesome. 
guys are making me hungry. Okay. All right. So <laughs> we know food is a way we can connect with our heritage. We had planned to have uh, Chef Ger- uh, Nelson Herman. He owns Alamar and Sober Mesa restaurants in Oakland here. He unfortunately had to go to New York for a family emergency. But he is an incredible uh, chef, uh, Afro-Dominican. Oh, sorry, I'm taking He's a, It's okay. He's a, he was a contestant on Top Chef, and he celebrates his Afro-Latino heritage through his food with a little twist, a little spice from Oakland. And he's not able to be here tonight, but his team came, and they made us some awesome food. So we are going to break bread together outside in the lobby and try some of his chicken, chicken sofrito. sofrito. Uh, which is a wonderful dish that he's prepared. We want you guys to continue the conversation. Uh, Before you head out, though, we just want to close it out with a couple thank yous. Uh, I want to thank all of our performers, all of our participants, everybody who helped us put this show together. Erica Chong-Shook was so incredible to us. Uh, We also had the teams here at KPD who supported us. California Report Magazine team, some of whom are here. Uh, Jessica Carissa, Izzy Bloom, Susie Rachow, Vic Malion, Katrina Schwartz, and our amazing KQED Live team who put this on, led by Ryan Davis, and big fans to Yoan Martinez and Danny Scarca. And we just want to remind you of a couple other KQED Live events that are coming up. We're having a craft beer night on November 16th and the That's My Word Hip Hop Game Night on November 30th. So thank you for coming. Check out the series. We also, really also this, we'll be here. this QR code will take you to the audio from our series. So please so, check it out. And keep go talking. Mix, go mix it up. Go mix it up. Thank you guys so much. Right.